may I point out that the chimney in the front room at Baker Street is still in need of a damn good sweeping out? You're aware that the hackney carriage by which you arrived had a damaged wheel? Yes, the left. And it's plain to the meanest intelligence that you have recently acquired a new bow for your violin. Same bow. New strings. That is Sherlock Holmes and his brother, played by Stephen Fry. He is... As many know, a Renaissance man, a writer, an actor, a comedian, a director, a quiz show host, and poet. In his new memoir, The Fry Chronicles, we meet the young Stephen Fry before he became a British national treasure. We're glad to have him with us in the studio, along with special correspondent Jeff Glor, who shares a passion for books. So welcome. Thank you. I would only say that unlike most Renaissance men, I don't wear tights. That's the only difference. <laughs> that's it. Thank everything you. else that it seems in this every, movie. Every, <laughs> in movie. That's unfortunately in the movie. There's one point where I don't wear anything. There is actually a nude scene in that show. Again, What's movie. great about this for us <laughs> is you learn new things. Yes. It turns out you were a friend of Stephen Jobs, Steve Jobs. I, I knew him I, yes. from many, many years and were at the memorial service. I, I went to the memorial service at Stanford, which was an extraordinary occasion. I was privileged to know Steve. I think because um, I, I am no means, by no means a coder, a geek or anything, but I absolutely love technology. I love the idea of it. I love where it, the relationship between man and objects and, and, and the furtherance of, of, of all kinds of, you know, the, the only reason I don't want to die, I'm quite happy to die, is because I, I can't bear the idea of not seeing the next gizmo in 50 years' time. What is your fascination beyond Steve Jobs with America? Because um, you have been to 50 States. I have. I'm one of the few people who've been to all 50 states. I tell you what it is. is uh, when I was about eight or nine, my mother told me as if it was the most casual thing in the world. She said, you know, um, uh, my father was a physicist. And she said, you know, your father was offered a job at uh, Princeton. That was while, <laughs> while I was pregnant with you. Uh, and I said, what? He said, yes. Uh, and he really considered it. It was quite a good job. He turned it down in the end. But of course, I suppose if he'd taken it, he would have been born in America. And I suddenly had this image that I could have been Obviously, identically, physically the same person, the same nose, same nipples, same knees, you know. There would have been no physical difference, but I would, I, I would have been Steve. I would have talked like this, I guess. I would have chewed gum. I would have worn jeans. I, I, I would have driven a Mustang when I was 17. I don't know, whatever it is, you, you know. Instead of being what I am uh, embarrassingly called a quintessential Englishman, would I have been a quintessential American? And I've always found the differences, similarities, and, and if you like, sort of uh, clashes between the American and the English of doing things utterly fascinating. So I put to the BBC that it had never been done on British television at least that someone had visited every every 50 of the states because to me there is no one America. I mean you ask a Mainer what his life is like and it's as different as to, in, to a North Dakotan or a Floridian or, a, or, or an Oregonian as, 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 as a Norwegian to a, to a Belgian. I mean they are like different countries and, and it was a fascinating experience. But even though that was shot in America it aired on the BBC so a lot of Americans didn't see it. I mean, no, I know. I know. It's strange that. Right. It, so fame level wise I mean you're this enormous <laughs> star in the UK. Yes. A lot of people wonder when you might take over America. Whoa, I don't know about that. I've left that to my, my erstwhile partner, Hugh Laurie. I can see her showing some photographs in the background. Uh, I, I used uh, a, a date of your friend. Talk about that friendship, yeah. too. Well, I was, I, I was very lucky after um, an extremely rocky childhood, which involved expulsion from a number of schools and imprisonment, and I, I managed to get a scholarship to Cambridge University, uh, imagining I would be um, an academic, that I would quietly grow tweed in a corner somewhere and write books on Shakespeare, which was my great passion. And um, I was I was introduced in my second week, I think, to this girl who whom I'd seen on stage, and she was a first year like me, but she'd already been on in a play, and it was travesties by uh, Stoppard, and, and I looked at her name in the program okay. and said, who is this E. Thompson? And someone said, Emma, <laughs> Emma, <laughs> Emma Thompson. How about Emma that? Thompson. Yeah. And so we became very good friends, and she said, you should try acting, you're a natural actor. So, so I started being plays with Emma, and she then introduced me to, the, she said, you've got to meet this guy, he's very, very funny, uh, he, he rose on, he's in the boat yeah, race, you right. know, the famous uh, Oxford and Cambridge yes. boat race, um, um, but uh, in his last year, he can't decide whether to be president of the Footlights Comedy Club or the Boat Club and uh, he was Hugh Laurie yeah. and so Hugh Laurie and I became just somehow it was actually a kind of love story and, and you'd be glad to hear a non-erotic love story it was a collaborative <laughs> com comic love story I, I sort of we fell in love with each other we just the moment yeah. we met literally the day we met we just started writing sketches together so what's your core competence as they say in the in the business world it comes down to one thing and one thing only and that is because actually it's my lack of talents that have given me the one talent that matters uh, because it's I was so uncoordinated. I couldn't catch a ball. I couldn't run. I hated all exercises and all sports. Um, and I couldn't sing or play music or dance. So all I had was language. 
and language became my absolute obsession. And I, I, would, I would read the dictionary, I would, um, I would read everything. And also, growing up gay, which I kind of knew I was by the time I was 10, there was no, in those days there was no internet, there were no, you know, there were no special channels, that, uh, you know, there was only the, the hideous prospect of imprisonment and men in raincoats mm. in squalid shops mm. and horrible stories in newspapers. And so I discovered through literature that I was not alone, that there were these extraordinary giants, of, whether, it be, whether it be Michelangelo or Oscar Wilde, uh, with whom I could, at least I could say, I, I, I can't be that ashamed. And, and so it gave me, in a sense, literacy and a love of literature, a love of reading, uh, in, in a way just to vindicate myself. But in the end, it's language. I mean, most of my humor, most of my insight, uh, um, I'm one of those people, my, my motto really is, how can I tell you what I think until I've heard what I'm going to say? Who first said that? I don't know, it's a great phrase. Because I used to say it was Auden, and somebody said, I, no, 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 wrote me no, and said it wasn't. I know, it's one of those ones, isn't it? <laughs> the book is called The Fry Chronicles. It is an autobiography of Stephen Fry. He's also in the movies. He has a lot to say because his core competence is language. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. What a pleasure. <laughs>